The issue of waste plastic is on the global agenda. We see it every day in terms of littering, illegal dumping. After the recent floods in KwaZulu-Natal, we saw it washed up on our beaches, in our rivers. We know that single-use plastic causes environmental and human health problems. And so globally, we're looking at how we address this problem. There have been competing views as to how we address this, depending on who the stakeholder is. So very often we'll see NGOs, lobby groups saying we need to ban single-use plastic. It's the only way to deal with this problem. We have industry saying this is a waste management problem. We can recycle our way out of the plastic pollution problem. And the thing is, is that these are competing views and we've never reached a point to say, you know what, it's not any one of those. It's going to require a suite of interventions to solve the plastic problem. Single-use plastics do serve a purpose. We've seen this elsewhere in Africa where we've had issues around water scarcity or where there have been health issues attached to water, where bringing someone bottled water gives them access to a reliable water source. So we know that it serves a purpose. We've seen it during the COVID pandemic, the importance of having access to single-use plastics. Having said that, there are a lot of plastics which could be considered unnecessary that don't need to be in the economy, that are perhaps not technically or economically recyclable. And so how do we phase out those problematic plastics? How do we eliminate the plastics that are not essential to our economy? How do we substitute materials where it makes sense to do that without unintended consequences and knock-on effects? How do we grow our waste collection and service delivery in South Africa to ensure that every South African has a regular waste collection service? How do we grow recycling and the local recycling market in South Africa to absorb that plastic that is being collected? On the 26th of July 2019, um, the contract between the Japanese government and UNIRA was signed here at the CSIR and we then started with a project shortly after looking at um, South Africa's um, sustainable transitioning from conventional plastics to more sustainable alternatives. The study had two main outputs. The one was um, an action plan for South Africa's um, transitioning to alternative materials and the other um, output was um, around capacity building and um, assisting recycling, um, specifically also um, developing capacity building materials for waste picker integration so that when we transition to alternative materials that the waste pickers are also um, aware of what materials um, can be recycled and what others can, can be is biodegradable. And the main findings from this study was then um, looking at what materials can be um, transitioned or alternatives can be used. And there we identified about 17 different materials. Then we also went on and did a life cycle sustainability assessment and that study was done specifically for polystyrene takeaway containers and the cup and the results of that study actually indicated that from a environmental life cycle um, assessment perspective that the polystyrene containers are the better option but when you look at persistence in the environment and pollution then uh, polystyrene is 400 times worse than any biodegradable alternative. Part of the project was then also to pilot test um, alternative materials to see if indeed they can be used as drop-ins or to replace the polystyrene containers and there the um, chemicals cluster here at the CSIR did some tests and it became apparent that some of the materials are very well suited to replace the um, injection molded um, alternative materials um, and there's also others that can be used just as films um, but the biodegradable alternatives are definitely an option um, and our study also indicated that there is potential for localization of the production of some of these materials but there are some um, issues that first needs to be resolved and one of the big issues that we are concerned about is that we already see an influx of some of the biodegradable materials being imported into South Africa and finding its way into the waste stream. But our current end of life management of those materials are not in place because many of those materials require um, 
industrial grade composting and currently those are in so, uh, short supply in South Africa and that's also where it's nice to now have the biodegradation lab where we can actually test to verify if the claims of biodegradability is in fact um, legitimate uh, because we also see a lot of greenwashing happening in this whole biodegradable space. We can't necessarily always plug and play solutions from elsewhere to address this problem in South Africa. So we've got a very important role in terms of evidencing to make sure that the decisions that we are taking are the right decisions, that they help to support the economy, that they help to support South African citizens, and that they don't have the unintended environmental and human health impacts. There are some innovative projects happening in this space whether it be waste plastic in road construction or into alternative materials that can be used in industry. This helps to create the demand, it helps to increase the prices for waste plastic that is paid and ultimately, as one of those solutions, helps to address the plastic waste problem. As we all know, uh, the biodegradable materials uh, can replace certain conventional plastics. Uh, not all of them, so uh, we have to be quite careful on what products we are targeting and for our group, the focus has been on those products that cannot be recycled, uh, that are typically used, uh, have a single lifetime, and then they're thrown away. And examples here include things like in the agricultural industry, the mulch films. Once the farmer has uh, finished with the, the mulching process and the crop is done, they have to take out these uh, mulches at their own cost and try and dispose of them. Uh, but in practice, some of them don't even dispose. Some of them end up burning these plastics, which again creates uh, you know, pollution to the environment. And again, when you keep them on the farms for long, what happens is they tend to disintegrate into what we call microplastics that have been shown to interfere even with the soil structure and hence the productivity of uh, uh, you know, the crops. So what we do as CSR in, in my group is to develop alternative biodegradable mulch films. And this project has been sponsored by the UK government through their FCDO, that's their Foreign Commonwealth uh, and Development Office, uh, to develop and showcase and do some field trials for biodegradable mulch films. And the approach we are taking there is to try and use locally available materials, uh, and in this case, starches, and preferably, starches from waste materials, to try and modify you know, commercially available bioplastics so that we can uh, tailor the service life of these mulches. And the reason why we need the tailoring is because you have different crops uh, with different uh, life cycles. So you'd want a solution for the different crops uh, with these different life cycles. So what we do is to engineer our materials so that they can last uh, the crop life cycle but once it's done, then the farmer can bury this in the soil and they don't have to worry about the cost of removal. They don't, worry, uh, they don't have to worry about burning this material, which uh, you know, uh, uh, pollutes the environment further. So it's a solution that's elegant, very appropriate for bioplastics. So these are typical examples where bioplastics have a place in the circular economy. In this particular instance, we're trying to use non-recycled plastic wastes so that we can find a new end market for it and we're utilizing it in the form of pellets um, and this third case study here at engineering 4.0 um, is basically focusing on the use of those pellets those plastic waste pellets um, through what we refer to as the wet method um, of using plastic wastes in the asphalt layer, which is the topmost layer um, that you are seeing here, just to see how well will it, will it work. Consistency is key. And you also have to align um, the plastic wastes that you select to the properties of the road eventually. And that's how you're able to select one plastic type from another plastic waste type. Okay? What we found to be the key benefit of using plastic waste in roads is rutting resistance you can use it um, for rutting resistance application due to traffic and at very high temperatures. So we found that the addition of plastic waste can reduce um, those rutting effects. The other role that we have to play as well is really to make sure that we inform the policy landscape as well. 
that the right policies are being put in place, the right legislation is being put in place to give effect to these solutions. And then finally through the work that we're doing with the Department of Science and Innovation is to help to grow the end use market for waste plastics to identify innovative new solutions of what we can do with waste plastic to help to grow the pool and the demand for plastic at end of life.